Something that I find fascinating about people in general, by the way, every single person you've ever met is fascinating. You've never met a boring person in your life. They don't exist. Sometimes people don't know why they're fascinating, but if you think about it, they've been created in the image of God with an eternal, significant purpose. That alone makes them fascinating. And it all looks different, and it gets walked out in different ways, especially if you look outside of our own little city and look at different cultures and times throughout the world. Throughout, It's fascinating. But even with all those differences and all that great diversity that's there, there are several things that are common to all of humanity. So if you were to look in Columbia, Missouri today, if you were to look in Italy a 1,000 years ago, if you were to look in South Africa 2,000 years ago, you would find the exact same thing. And some of those are this. Universal to humanity is our desire for play. You notice that everybody likes to play. Sometimes it's organized sports such as soccer. Sometimes it's much more basic games, hide and go seek and tag. When we got the opportunity to go to China about 10 or so years ago, the kids over there are playing hide and go seek, they're playing tag. It's a universal game. Other things are universal, laughter. Everybody laughs. Everybody looks for humor. They enjoy laughter. One of the coolest things to ever see is a baby laughing. You can't look at a baby laughing and not laugh yourself. It doesn't work that way. And then you're wondering, did they get the joke? How does that work? (laughs) But it's amazing to see. Our expressions are universal. The different expressions we make with our faces, I saw that study where they conducted, where they observed people that were born blind. The idea was they've never modeled someone else's expression. They've never seen a facial expression, but they observed them to see how they respond to happiness and sadness and pain and everything that we experience, and their facial expressions are the exact same as people that have sight. It's universal to our human experience. And these are just a few things. We could throw in desire for safety, for security, desires for comfort, desire for well-being of future generations. These are all universal to humanity. And something else that's universal to humanity that we all experience and we all know about is fear. You see, we have all experienced fear in our lives. In fact, Fear can be considered a universal language. Fear is often considered the first emotion we've ever experienced. The first emotion a person feels is fear. Well, how do we know that? Well, picture yourself, see if you can remember that far back, but picture yourself as an unborn child. Can anybody imagine? (laughs) You're comforted, you're warm, you've got direct deposit of food right to your belly. It doesn't get much better than that, church. And then one day, those walls around you just squeeze, and you're thrust out into this cold world, this world that's not warm. You're feeling this cold substance fill your lungs, and you don't know what that is. You see all these bright lights around you. You're blinded by them. And then what does a baby do immediately? They cry. Now, what kind of a cry is that? Is that a cry of joy? Is that a cry of expectancy? Is that a cry of, oh, now I get to see my mama? No. That's a cry of terror. That's a cry of, what is going on here? A cry of, I have no control, and I don't know what's happening, and what that baby is feeling, even though they can't express it well, even though they can't verbalize it, they're expressing it, what they're feeling is sheer terror and fear. It is the first emotion that we feel, and it's also an emotion that we feel all through our lives. You see, it doesn't, we don't grow out of fear. You see, you've experienced this when you went for the ultrasound to check on your child, and the technician taking the ultrasound says, whoa, and it says, I got to go get somebody, and runs out of the room. You've experienced that fear. Where all that's left that you can say, God, I'm scared. You've experienced this fear when you realize you're only a year or two away from being able to retire, and then the manager announces to everybody that the company is going bankrupt. 
and you wonder what's going to happen next. You'd have to start over someplace else, and it would take several years to replace that income. God, I'm scared. You've experienced this when you've come home from work, and you're expecting to see the kids running around, and you're starting to wonder what's for dinner, just what's going on that evening. But instead, when you walk in the house, the first thing that you immediately hear is the deafening sound of silence. And you walk around and then you see a note on the table that says your wife is taking the kids to stay with her mom for a few days. And you know things have been tough. You know your marriage has been hanging on by a thread. And you know you should be a better husband, but you don't know how. What do you express right there? God, I'm scared. I don't know what to do. Fear is a universal emotion. And it's an emotion that we experience in all different ways and kinds throughout our life. The question that we need to ask ourselves today is, what do we do with our fears? A better question is this, what does God do with our fears? Or even this, how do we relate to God through our fear? We've been told over and over again that God desires to walk with us, that Jesus wants to walk with us, that he wants to be in our life, and that we want to follow him with everything that we have and everything that we are. But how do we do that when the only words we can muster out, God, I'm scared. And today we're talking about the type of fear that goes with these drawn-out situations. Sometimes there's a fear that's immediate. You've heard the stories or maybe you've seen the videos of somebody walking down the street and then their car is just careening right towards them and they're able to scoop up a child and jump right out of the way. You know what I'm talking about. What's that person thinking in that moment of time? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Instincts take over and they go. And then afterwards, they have to calm down because their heart's racing among them and their eyes are real big. That is definitely a source of fear. But today we're talking about the fear that just seems to drag out. And sometimes we might not even know the source of it. We might not know why it is we're responding, why our body is responding the way that it is. The fear that keeps you up at night. Have you experienced that? How do we relate to God in the midst of our fears? And the answer that we're going to see is this. We seek God with our fears, through our fears, and we meet him in prayer. See, when fear grips hold of your heart, when fear grips hold of your mind, we rest in Jesus. Now, how is that possible? What does that look like? Well, this is part of a series that we began just a couple weeks ago entitled Real Life in Real Prayers. So often when we think of prayer, we think, God, would you bless the food? Amen. Other times when we think of prayer, it's as if we're giving God a to-do list. We're making our requests, and requests are a good thing. There's nothing wrong with them. But there's so much more to prayer. Sometimes when we approach God and we have these emotions, be they fear or pain or anger, we have this mindset that I can't bring that to God. When I approach God, I'm supposed to pretend that I'm fearless, that I'm not experiencing any pain. And so maybe we pretend those things don't exist. Or on the other side, we let those emotions, we let those feelings control us and overwhelm us. Well, through prayer, God invites us to a different road. Through the Psalms, which is what we're looking at, these are highly, highly emotional prayers. But they're prayers in which the emotions don't control the prayer, but the prayer is able to be spoken through the fear, through the pain, through the the joy, the happiness, whatever it is. So that's what we want to see. Now, what we're going to see today is that we are by no means the first people to struggle with fear. In fact, Israel had a king, one of their greatest kings, many, many years ago, King David. He was a man that knew fear. You might wonder, David, wasn't he the one that killed the giant? Yes. Wasn't David, the one that killed the lion and the bear that led Israel for years, wasn't that David? Yes, that was David. He knew what it was to be victorious, and he knew what it was 
to have fear overwhelm him. You see, towards the end of his reign, his son Absalom, he rose up against David. He had been plotting to try to take over the throne. He wanted his father out so that he could become king. And so one day, Absalom, he raises up this army and he goes into Jerusalem. Something interesting, by the way, maybe ironic. Absalom, it means something like father of peace. And he invades Jerusalem, the city of peace. There's something not right in this picture, church. And so Absalom, he comes in with his army. And David, he tells in 2 Samuel chapter 15, let's put that verse on the screen, please. This is what he announces to those around us. He says, come, we must flee, or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately, or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin on us and put the city to the sword. And so David and those around him, this one of the greatest kings in Israel's history, he is running for his life. He is fleeing the city. Elsewhere in that narrative, we see that Absalom has about 12,000 soldiers that he comes in and then he sends out to pursue David, his father, in order to kill David so that Absalom may be king. Now, in this time when David is fleeing, he does. He models for us. He shows us what we should do when we feel overwhelmed by fear. He prays. And lucky for us, we have that prayer preserved. David prays this prayer, and then later on, he writes it down. Somebody writes it down to show us how to pray in the midst of our fears. Open up your Bibles. I want you to see this. This is Psalms chapter 3 that we're going to look at today. Psalms is the book right in the middle of your Bible, and we're going towards the beginning of it. Psalm 3. And in this prayer, we'll see modeled for us how we can pray through our own fears, how we can relate to God through our fears. Psalm 3. It has that heading right underneath the psalm. If you can see it there, it says, A psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. That's recorded in 2 Samuel 15, if you want to look at that later on. Psalm 3, verse 1, it says this, Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. You see, right off the bat, David names his fear. As we've gone through this, this series so far, a couple weeks ago, we talked about praying through our pain. Last week, we talked about prayers of confession, how to confess our sins to God. And then today, as we talk about praying through fear, they always begin in the same place. Name it. Name your pain. Acknowledge your sin. Name your fear. Bring it to God and name it out loud. Not because God doesn't know, but because you can process it with him. Here, David names his fear. Look at what word is repeated over and over there. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me. He's got a bunch of them coming after him. 12,000 soldiers are hunting him down. Now, what's interesting about David's fear right here is his fear would not be my fear if I was in his place. You see, if I was in his place, my main fear would be for my life. If that army catches me, it's over. But David's fear, he reflects it. In verse 2, many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. David's main fear is that God is done with him. That God was happy to walk with David for a season, but because David failed and messed up, God doesn't want anything to do with him. Now, what are David's failures? Oh, there are many. If you read the account of David, you'll see there's a turning point in his life when one day, instead of leading his army out to battle, which is what kings were called to do, he stepped back and he told his general, why don't you go? And as he stayed home, 
He saw a woman that he desired. He forces himself upon her. And then she becomes pregnant. So to cover that up, he has her husband, who happens to be a very loyal companion of David. He has him killed. And then he marries that woman to try to hide the sin. But as so frequently happens when we try to hide our faults and our failures, they get out. The whole nation knew of David's sin. That was one failure. David failed as a father. I mean, his son is chasing him, trying to kill him. What greater proof do you need that David's family was just downright crazy? David had many wives and concubines and had many, 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 many sons and daughters. He probably couldn't even name them all. Couldn't remember who they were. And in fact, several years before this, Absalom had killed another one of David's sons because that son had raped Absalom's sister. David can't put up his stand and say, I have succeeded as a father. That doesn't work. He failed. And now he's wondering, is God done with me? Have you been in that spot where all you can think of is the ways that you've fallen short, the ways that you've messed up in life? And then you're left wondering and asking yourself, what would God ever want to do with me? That's where David finds himself right here. That is his great, great fear. And so he names it. He says, this is what I'm fearful of. And then what does he do? Look at verse 3. But you, Lord, you are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me. From his holy mountain, David reminds himself of God's faithfulness. He reminds himself of God's promises. He reminds himself of the evidence that is all around him, that God has not left him or forgotten him or given up on him. See, sometimes our emotions, our heart tells us things, and through our mind, we have to say, no, that's not true. David's emotions were telling him that God had given up on him. And David had to tell his heart, tell his emotions, God is still with me. God has got this going on right around me. A few interesting things in here. He says that the Lord is a shield. Often the shield that they would carry would be a small oval shield you could hold on one arm to protect their vital areas, but not huge. If it's too big, then it makes it hard to move and to run around. But the shield that David pictures here is that God is a shield all around him. God has David protected in front, behind, side to side. God is his shield. He says that God is his glory. That glory is very interesting. It also gives the picture of heavy, of weighty. This is a word that we use frequently when you hear of an idea or something. You think, well, that's weighty. That's a heavy thought. David and he's trying to portray his own status and his own glory. Remember, he can't do that. He can't give off his glory as a father. He can't give off his glory as a nation builder. He can't give off his glory because in all those different ways. And so he's reminded himself, God is my glory. He is the one that makes up my lack. David has reminded himself, I cannot trust in myself or in my own deeds. I can only trust in God's. See, when we are overwhelmed by all the different ways that we fall short and that we've messed up, when we are overwhelmed by a sense of regret and shame because of our failures, oh, it speaks life to remember that glory is not based on our successes and failures. The glory is based on God alone. David says, Lord, you are my shield. You are my glory. You are the one who lifts my head. I can only hold my head up because of what you have done. He reminds himself, I call to the Lord, and he answers me. And so David names his fear. He reminds himself of God's goodness and God's faithfulness. Well, what does he do now? Look at verse 5. I lie down and sleep. That's good right there. I lie down and sleep. I wake again. Lord sustains me. I will not fear, 
though tens of thousands assail me on every side. David's thinking there's 12,000 following me. If there were 100,000 after me, I wouldn't fear. Instead, I would sleep because my trust is in God, my shield, my glory, the one who lifts my head. You know those sleepless nights when your mind is so occupied by your fear, it's so occupied in dread at what may come, at the thing that which you have no control over? How would it feel to be able to sleep? The Bible tells us all through, Jesus gives us rest. Come unto me, all you who are worried, who are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. When we trust God, that's when we can sleep. And now, now, now David gets to his requests. Remember, we said requests are important. They're a vital part of prayer. But there's so much more there. This psalm, it's only eight verses. But there's only one verse of requests. Everything else is David processing his fear with God. Look at verse 7. Arise, Lord. Deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the that has got to be somebody's life verse in here. I know it. <laughs> verse 8. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. You see those verses there? Break their jaw, strike the wicked. That doesn't resonate well with us. We tend to have trouble with that. We tend to wonder, well, why? Wait a minute. Aren't we supposed to love our enemies? We can't pray for their destruction, can we? Echo, I guess. I hope that's a good sound. We'll find out. <laughs> the picture that it's given here, well, first of all, remember this. This is real life and real prayer. And if you really feel angry, isn't it great to be able to express that to God? Now, God might respond and say, calm down your anger, and that's okay. But we can either squash our anger, pretend it doesn't exist, or we can share it with God. I think sharing it with God is much, much more healthy. But this picture here, strike my enemies on the jaw, break the teeth of the wicked, it's the picture of breaking the teeth of a lion, of a lion in order to free its prey from its grasp. Remember, when David was a boy, he was a shepherd boy. He wasn't raised in the palace. He was raised with the sheep and cared for them. And he recalls a time when the lion came and he snatched his sheep out of the mouth of the lion. And so for David, as he is pursued by these 12,000 men, as he is pursued by this great fear that is coming upon him, he's reminded of that time when God has delivered from the mouth of the lion. And so David's able to say, remember that before, Lord? Do it again. Break the mouth of this lion that is seeking to devour me. Strike them on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. And he gives this prayer. The six verses of, here is my fear, do something about it, Lord, and I praise you. He gives this prayer not knowing how things will turn out. You see, that's where we find ourselves, church, not knowing how things will turn out. When we are experiencing fear, when we are taking our fear to God, it's because we don't know what will happen with that tumor. It's because we don't know if the surgery got it all, or if the chemo and radiation are sufficient. When we take our fears to God, it's because we don't know if our job will be there next week, if we'll be able to retire when we want it, or if we'll need to work more and more and more just to sustain ourselves. When we take our fears to God, it's because we don't know what will be the end result of our marriage the one that's hanging on by a thread, the one that we know, oh, I've messed up a lot, and so has she. We don't know how it will turn out. We don't have control there. And so we pray, God, here's my fear. I need you to move in this. Would you do it, Lord? And then we praise him for it. How do we do these prayers of fear? We bear our hearts to God. We be real with him. We name our fear. We remind ourselves of God's goodness. And then we rest. 
when we trust God deep down in our hearts and deep down in our souls, that's when we can rest. The Bible talks about a peace that surpasses all understanding. You know what that peace that surpasses understanding looks like? It looks like having 12,000 soldiers chasing you, and you can lie down and rest. Because you know God's got this. And so wherever you are in your fear, oh church, take it to God. Name it. Remind yourself of God's goodness and rest. Go ahead, close your Bibles. Worship band, come back up, please. I want us to take a few moments right now, and I want us to walk through this together. And so close your Bibles or your phones or whatever it is you have the scripture on. Put those away. Close your eyes. And I want you to think about what is that fear that you have right now? Is it medical? Is it something within your marriage or something, a disconnect between you and your kids? Is it relational? Maybe you and your brother, you grew up with each other. But over the years, you just seem to get further and further and further apart. Is your fear that there's nothing left there? Is your fear that you won't be able to make it financially? Is your fear, maybe it's like David's, maybe your fear is that whenever you think of God, you begin to wonder, what would he want to do with me? Take a moment right now in your minds and in your hearts name that fear God I'm scared and this is why name that fear